go ahead and get started. We do have a lot of information and want to give you a chance to really take it in and respond to it. So I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone. There'll be times a little later where you'll be invited to uh, unmute yourself or uh, use the chat. Um, but but let me welcome everyone to this uh, Alliance of Baptist series on uh, apartheid, an epistle from Palestinian Christians. And a welcome to those of you who are part of the Alliance community, who are members of Alliance congregations, who are members or friends of uh, not only the Alliance, but Churches for Middle East Peace and other uh, communities. Uh, you are welcome here. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this very important discussion. My name is Allison Tanner, and I am the uh, convener of the Justice in Palestine and Israel community. Uh, several from the community are here in the room, so I want to welcome you all. Um, let me welcome especially uh, G.J. Tarazi, who um, has um, uh, long convened, I believe even instigated the community uh, long before I was on the scene, um, and, uh, and all members of the um, community for, for really thinking through the leadership, for thinking through um, and helping us get going on this discussion. I also want to um, uh, recognize that I am the Palestinian advocacy representative for the Alliance of Baptists, uh, and I have uh, in the past traveled a few times to Palestine to sit with our Palestinian uh, siblings and uh, share with them the Alliance's commitment to their quest for justice, freedom, and liberation. I'm also a pastor of public witness at Lakeshore Avenue Baptist Church, a uh, partner congregation of the Alliance. Um, we church, are here. What church? I'm sorry? What church did you say? Lakeshore Avenue Baptist Church in yeah. Oakland, California. Ah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, and JJ, uh, GJ, why don't you uh, just name your church and, and offer a word of hello, and then we'll get going. Marhaba. Uh, and uh, my wife and I are members of Ravensworth Baptist Church in Annandale, Virginia. And I look forward for our, our discussion. Thanks. If you're um, newer to the Alliance or haven't been following uh, our work, the Alliance has long been committed to the work uh, for justice and peace in Palestine and Israel. We have taken the time to educate ourselves on the impression, oppression and injustice of Palestinians. We have engaged in advocacy and nonviolent resistance uh, through the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. We have named the harms of Christian Zionism, recognizing that the largest pro-Israel lobby in the United States is indeed Christians, Christian Zionists. Um, and so we have a role to play in uh, reclaiming uh, our faith tradition to be a tradition of liberation and not one of oppression. We are in a moment of history right now where a growing number of networks are using the word apartheid to describe the on the ground realities of Palestinians. In the past few years, many human rights organizations in the United States, in Israel, in Palestine and internationally, as well as news outlets and a variety of denominations are naming apartheid. And of course, we recognize that Palestinians have long named for decades and decades their reality as apartheid. So with our own alliance commitments to justice, to liberation, and to challenging all forms of racism, it is so important for us to take seriously the charge of apartheid and what it means to continue the work of liberation for our siblings in Palestine and Israel, as well as in the United States. This is going to be a three-part series, January, February, and March on the third Thursdays of the month, in which we look up, which we um, go through a document that is written by Palestinian Christians and their international community. And just as a way of uh, 
vetting the materials that we're going through and um, uh, why these uh, particular articulations of apartheid are so important. Um, we'll be looking at this document, a dossier on Israeli apartheid, a pressing call to churches around the world. Um, and there'll be a link to this document placed in the chat, uh, grounded in Psalm 82, three, do justice to the afflicted. This document was written by, again, Kairos Palestine, a group of Palestinian Christians who have been gathering for um, almost 15 years now and offering clarion calls to the international Christian community to, to step in and be the presence of God um, to help incarnate their justice and liberation, as well as Global Kairos for Palestine, the international Christian community who has heard the Palestinian calls to the international church and has stepped in. And, and I named this because I have sat with folks from Kairos Palestine and Global Kairos for Justice. I have broke bread with these communities. I have worshiped with and lamented with and prayed with this community representing the Alliance. And so when they put forth this document, um, I have an obligation to, um, uh, to share it back with the Alliance and for all of us to lift it up to read it. And, and let's just take a moment to read their introductory words. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we members of Kairos Palestine and Global Kairos for Justice have created a theological study for Christians and other civil society organizations who want to learn more about the crime of apartheid and why Palestinians and a growing number of churches and human rights organizations are using the word to describe Israelis' oppression of Palestinians. In this guide, you will find, and they're gonna give you three, uh, three specific uh, things that we're going to find in this guide, which is the basis of our three part series. Uh, the first thing we'll find is a clear description of apartheid and how Israel's laws, policies, and practices meet the international definition, and that will be our focus for the session tonight. And then in February, we'll come back and study um, their biblical and theological reflection describing the sin of apartheid, and then in March, we'll gather to look at uh, the heartfelt call that they offer to the global church to hear the pleas of Palestinian Christians, as well as a list of recommended actions. Um, also included uh, in this uh, document, if you wanna download and read it yourself, are brief summaries of and links to many of the reports cited above, statements made by churches, faith groups, and international leaders, including prominent Israeli Jews, as well as a short book list. We call upon churches around the world to receive and study this dossier and respond to the evidence and the call to do justice. It is our hope that this study will equip the global church to rise up and join Palestinian Christians as we work to end Israeli apartheid regime for the sake of all who live in the Holy Land. And then to be quite transparent, uh, uh, the, the final thing after we've done this series or as we move toward uh, what it means that we've engaged in this series. The, just, the Community for Justice in Palestine and Israel has put forth a statement naming Israeli apartheid that will be discussed at the business meeting of the, um, for the Alliance when they gather on April 1st. So we're really um, hoping that this discussion leads us to further action. And we invite you to be part of the educational journey with us that, that leads us to really discerning what does it mean for us to embody the gospel of liberation um, in response to our Palestinian Christian siblings saying, please step in and help. Having said all that, I'd like to start just by, um, when you hear the word apartheid, I recognize it's a loaded word. It gets used in a lot of different ways, places, situations, uh, just to get your head around where you're coming to this study from. If you had to share in one to three words, and you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself right now, but what, when you think of apartheid, what do you think of? Separation, pain. It's really surprised me that that this word is being used 
but that's why I'm here to learn why, because having gone through the South African apartheid, um, I'm involved with Presbyterians in a Presbyterian Jewish Israeli uh, communication. So just just a, a word. I don't want to okay. step too far down the road right now, but I both have right. separation and surprise about this particular word. Yes. Thank you. I heard uh, in the chat someone wrote legal discrimination. Unequal. Jimmy Carter in the chat. South Africa racism. Gayla writes, I've become to, I, I, I associate the word with South Africa, but I've come to understand that the US Jim Crow system as meeting those criteria. Absolutely. Yes. And I wanna be clear as we're, as we're looking and exploring apartheid in another country, let's be very clear to name the apartheid that has existed and continues to impact the inequalities in our country. Enforced inequality on the basis of race. Wall, the wall around Bethlehem. So we come with a lot of ideas. It's a, um, it's a powerful word. Um, so as we enter into trying to understand both what apartheid is and does what is happening on the ground in Palestine and Israel constitute apartheid, I'm going to show a video and it's put together by Amnesty International, a renowned international human rights organization. Let's hear from them um, about how they understand um, the situation in Palestine and Israel as apartheid and why. Nope, wrong, showing you my notes. Here we go, and we're, we're just gonna go to Amnesty International's website. Um, they have declared the crime of apartheid, uh, the government of Israel's system of oppression against Palestinians. And let's hear how they frame the discussion. When you the word apartheid, what do you think of? Probably the disturbing images of racial segregation between whites and blacks in South Africa, where a regime ruled by a racist white minority declared themselves officially superior to the black majority, then proceeded to dominate them. South Africa's apartheid system officially ended in the mid-1990s, but that doesn't mean apartheid can't happen elsewhere. Here, in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, Palestinians are being forced off their land and out of their homes, separated and segregated by laws, walls and checkpoints. They live in a constant state of fear and insecurity and deliberately impoverished. While, on the other hand, Israeli authorities have given the Jewish Israeli population privilege over Palestinians in just about every facet of life. The question is, does this all amount to the crime of apartheid? First, the definition of apartheid. The crime against humanity of apartheid is perpetrated when particular serious human rights violations are committed with the purpose of establishing and maintaining a system of domination by one racial group over another and systematically oppressing them. But does this system exist in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories? And there's been a growing debate about whether the situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories is apartheid. And now is the time for us as the world's largest human rights organization to offer up our analysis. Our findings and criticism are directed not at the Jewish people, but at the Israeli state. It's the Israeli state that put in place the policies that implement the laws and the practices that oppress Palestinians. Well, Israeli leaders have been clear about their intentions from the beginning. In 1948, 
just before he became the first Prime Minister of Israel, Ben Gurion visited Lifta and other Palestinian areas near Jerusalem that were completely emptied of Palestinian residents following attacks by Jewish forces. He stated, There are no Arabs, 100% Jews. If we persist, it is quite possible that in the next six or eight months there will be considerable changes in the country, very considerable, and to our advantage. More than 70 years later, then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu posted on Instagram that Israel is not a state of all its citizens, but rather the nation state of the Jewish people and only them. So. It's no surprise that Israel built a system of racially discriminatory laws, policies and practices that privilege only Jewish people. And Palestinians, well, Palestinians live there too. They were there before Israel was established. But, as we will explain, they've been trapped for decades in a system that treats them as a lesser, non-Jewish racial group. Before Israel was established in 1948, Palestinians comprised most of the population, around 70%, and owned the vast majority of private land, about 90%, in what was British Mandate Palestine. Jews, many of whom had emigrated from Europe, comprised around 30% of the population, and they and Jewish institutions owned about 6.5% of the land. The port of Haifa in Palestine lies shattered by bombs and strewn with dead. In the course of establishing Israel as a Jewish state in 1948, Israeli authorities acted to turn the situation on its head and were responsible for the mass expulsion of Palestinians and the destruction of hundreds of villages, forcing around 800,000 Palestinians out of their homes and lands. Thousands of Palestinians and Jews were killed in the context of attacks on civilians during this conflict. Today there are around 6 million Palestinian refugees who Israel denies the right to return to their homes. After the 1967 war, Israel occupied the Palestinian territories of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza. Israel's brutal military rule, coupled with the establishment and expansion of illegal Jewish settlements, has coerced Palestinians into enclaves creating further fragmentation and segregation. The objective? maintain Jewish-Israeli hegemony and maximize control of land. In the city of Jerusalem, the Israeli official policy is to maintain at least a 60% Jewish majority. If you've always felt a deep yearning for Jerusalem, now is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity not only to stand within its gates, but also to build the home of your dreams there. So where do all the Palestinians live now? 3.4 million live outside of Israel in the occupied territories, mainly in refugee camps in neighboring countries. 2.5 million Palestinians live in Israel and East Jerusalem, restricted to enclaves that make up around 3% of the entire area. 3 million Palestinians live in the occupied West Bank, but are only allowed to access 40% of the land to live and work. The rest of the area is for the Jewish-Israeli settlers only. Two million are trapped in the Gaza Strip, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Fragmentation of the Palestinian society and the dispossession of their lands are key pillars of Israel's apartheid system to maintain domination and control. But there's more. The unequal structure of nationality and status, restrictions on freedom of movement, use of military rule, denial of right to political participation, or the right to peaceful protest, and cruel separation of families all add to the complex system that we see today. The world in general hasn't woken up to the fact that there is an entrenched system of oppression against Palestinians across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, wherever they may live, by the Israeli state. It's a system that's been put in place and maintained for decades, and it's that system that is the root cause of so many of the violations, the misery and the suffering that millions of Palestinians face on a daily basis. One way to understand this segregation and oppression is to look at the ID system. Jewish Israelis have only one ID card, with a status that grants them the rights to live almost anywhere they wish in the country. 
They can move freely with access to health care and vast resources. Palestinians, on the other hand, have four types of ID cards, if any at all. The kind of ID card you are given determines the level of rights you can enjoy and controls where you can go and what you can do. If you hold a green card, you are subject to military rule. And if you have a green card with a Gaza address, it means you're trapped in a 365 km square open-air prison under Israeli military blockade in place since 2007. Israel controls what goes in and what goes out, from children's toys to medical supplies. 90% of the people have no access to safe drinking water, 47% are unemployed, 56% live in poverty. Palestinians with a Gaza ID are forbidden from going to Jerusalem in the West Bank, even if they have family there. Some people in the West Bank are considered to live there illegally and can be deported immediately to Gaza if found by the army, even if they have been in the West Bank for decades. Whereas, if you hold a green card which has a West Bank address, then you live here. This green card means you can live within specific enclaves surrounded by illegal Israeli settlements. And there's a separation wall and fences built around you since 2002, which Palestinians call the Apartheid Wall. It's 8 metres high in places and 700 kilometres long. That's twice the height of the Berlin Wall and more than four times its length. 80% of it is built inside the West Bank, occupying even more Palestinian land. There are separate roads for Israelis and Palestinians. Hundreds of checkpoints scattered throughout not to mention the 54 years of occupation which has devastated the lives of millions of Palestinians. Palestinians with a West Bank ID can travel to Gaza or East Jerusalem, but only if they receive a permit from the military to do so. This blue ID is for Palestinians in East Jerusalem. They can travel to the occupied West Bank as well as to Israel, but they are not citizens of Israel. They have only been granted a residency status. This means that they cannot vote in Israeli national elections and if they leave East Jerusalem for too long, for example, to study or work abroad or in other parts of the occupied West Bank, their residency is revoked, so they can't return. Since 1967, Israel has revoked the residency status of more than 14,600 Palestinians from East Jerusalem. Finally, Palestinian citizens of Israel, they have been through it all. They are the group that remained in Israel despite the ethnic cleansing in 1948. They lived under Israeli military rule that applied only to them and not Jewish Israelis for 18 years between 1948 and 1966. They were made citizens but can never become nationals and enjoy equality unless they become Jewish, which the law prohibits. They are the only Palestinians who can run and vote in Israeli elections and they can move relatively freely but the inequality against them was never dismantled and they face daily institutional discrimination, including as members of parliament. And if this complex ID system wasn't enough to segregate the Palestinian community, in 2002, Israel introduced a law that prohibits family unification. That's right, denying Palestinians the right to live with their loved ones if their ID cards are different. And this woman, is one of thousands of Palestinians who Israel will not issue any ID card. She can't travel, can't hug her family, only see them meters away across the border. Putting down roots, the family home, these are crucial parts of what make a strong community. To make sure Palestinian communities can't develop any further, Israel has made it almost impossible to grant building permits for Palestinian homes. So, Palestinians live in a catch-22 situation. In order to have shelter or develop their communities, they must build without a permit. And if they do so, Israel can demolish the structures on the basis that it was built without a permit. Right now, there are over 150,000 Palestinians currently living under the constant threat of demolition and forced eviction, many of them for the second or third time. In the West Bank, an average of 18 Palestinian structures were demolished every week in 2020, the same year Israel issued 1,094 building permits for Jewish applicants, and only one for a Palestinian. This goes back to the heart of the issue. To maintain the state's character as Jewish, Israel systematically disadvantages Palestinians while privileging Jewish Israelis. This racist privilege has been enshrined in laws, policies and practices, and it enables Palestinian resources to be taken 
in order to economically benefit Jewish Israeli citizens. The system of apartheid is the Israeli state's oppression and domination of Palestinians on a daily basis. It's the, the laws, the policies and the practices that it puts in place and then implements to control Palestinians' daily lives. And then the, the crimes of apartheid. The crimes of apartheid are those acts, those violations, those patterns of violations that Israel is committing to create and then maintain that system of apartheid. Amnesty International and other rights organizations have been documenting patterns of human rights violations and international crimes for decades. These are the most visible and violent part of this system. At the end of May 2020, 4,236 Palestinians were held in Israeli prisons, and 352, including two children, were held without charge or trial. Between September 2000 and February 2017, Israeli forces killed 4,868 Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories, including 1,793 children, outside the context of armed conflict. And Amnesty International is not aware of any case in which an Israeli soldier has been convicted of willfully causing the death of a Palestinian in the occupied territories since 1987. This imbalance of rights, justice and accountability is never more clear than when a Jewish Israeli life appears to have more value than a Palestinian's. Israel's apartheid and its cruel and prolonged strategies deliberately disadvantage Palestinians wherever they live. They cannot claim and enjoy equality with Jewish Israelis. Look, everyone can make a difference. Together, we need to speak out on behalf of Palestinians. We need to speak about the human rights violations that they are suffering. We need to talk about the apartheid, the system of apartheid to which they are subjected. Because by campaigning together, putting pressure on the Israeli state, we can have this system of apartheid dismantled. Join us, join our campaign. Everyone has the power to make a difference. When you hear the word apartheid, Okay, I want us to pause now for a moment of silence to let sink in what you've heard and, and feel the impact of it and, and reflect upon it. God help us make sense of all of this. Amen. And now, my apologies, my son is coming in bright, but, and now much, much like when we started in just one or two words, what, what reactions do you have? And you can use the chat or you can unmute yourself. But again, this isn't a time for comments, but just reactions. Shock. Misinformation previously. I think for some of us, it's so far beyond trying to decide whether this is apartheid or not. That it's time to get beyond that and be focused more on what to be doing. 
I was saying it was so much worse than what I thought. I mean, I knew it was bad, but it's worse than I thought. And in the chat, grief, deep sadness, horror, overwhelming sadness and anger. You know, the thought that comes to me is this is our major ally in the Arab world. No wonder we don't have any other ones. And if you were at the fall gathering, there might be a lot of similarities you see to the history of our country. Mm -hmm. When you I don't, don't why? Mm -hmm. When do when you don't see and uh, the oppression and the media blacks out that reality, I think that's the role of the church to educate the public. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I hope that you will um, um, be able to be part of all three parts of this series so that we will not just look at the facts, we will not just feel the feelings, um, but we will take those and move constructively um, in ways that Palestinians have already laid before us and asked us to do. Let's take a moment now and uh, a, a moment. Let's take some time now and do some unpacking of what we've seen. And let me. Uh, One moment. So what is apartheid? Apartheid is described in the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, written in 1973, as inhumane acts inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. There are three international laws that really weigh in on what constitutes apartheid. This one by the International Convention on the Suppression of Punishment and of the Crime of Apartheid is the one that is most often quoted but two other ones are the Geneva Conventions and the Rome Statute of International of the International Criminal Court. And when you take all these three international entities together, it comes down to there are three decisive conditions for what constitutes the crime of apartheid. Number one, a system of separation or segregation for domination for domination and that can be based on race, creed, or ethnicity. Two, legal measures, legislative measures to legally enforce, and three, human rights violations. And as you can see, and it was already mentioned, um, in South Africa, these three conditions were met. In the United States, in an era of Jim Crow law, this three conditions were met. Um, and now I'm gonna invite GJ to talk very directly about the facts on the ground in Palestine. And uh, uh, by now you may have already decided for yourself that these three decisive conditions are met. Let's, let's give him a chance to unpack even more um, what's happening on the ground and how they match up with these conditions. And GJ, I think I'm going to hand it to you right now. 
And you're going to control the, the slides? Yes. Are you ready for the first one? Yes. Uh, these are um, posters that have been developed by Visualizing Palestine, a wonderful organization that puts a lot of information like you see there. And if um, you just Google them, you'll see so many uh, pieces of, of information that Amnesty in International shared with us in, um, in what we just saw. Dr. Tanner, uh, next slide. Um, I, I just want to give you a little background. Uh, my father's family um, can trace its history back to Gaza to 1770. And that tracing back is based on men, mostly, uh, in our family tree. And all of them um have baptismal certificates from a church that still exists after 1600 years of its life in Gaza City through their baptismal certificates at that church and uh, that's my background as I got to know my father's history and life that that separation barrier you see uh in that Amnesty International also called it the apartheid wall. And uh, we, the church at Ravensworth, uh, have taken three trips to Palestine. This one is the wall that's around uh, Bethlehem. And the upper uh, left picture that we took was people, were people going to work. And in order for them to work, they have to wait sometimes for hours to go into Israel to work. I'm sorry. Um, and that's the Omar Mosque that uh, you see in the background of this, uh, this barrier. It's 403 miles long and it's 25 feet high. There are cages that people go through like the ones on the left. And there are a uh, number of people from uh, Ravensworth who were at uh, at that wall. I think this picture was taken in 2005. Dr. Tanner? We uh, had to drive through a number of checkpoints. As of 2020, there are 593 checkpoints and roadblocks scattered within the West Bank. This is Palestine, Palestinian territories that Israel is controlling. Uh, and the checkpoints in Israel serve more than, or they go through about 100,000 Palestinians living in the West Bank every day. Uh, which is unbelievable. Next, please. This is a, another visualizing Palestine, and you could see the, the systematic oppression that Palestinians have to go through. And we can talk a lot about East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza Strip, and we'll be getting into that as we go through, and, and I'll show you some pictures uh, that we experienced on our trips there. Let's go to the next one. I, I just want to have a discussion rather than just throwing out all this information. So I'm sorry for rushing. These uh, four colonies are built on Palestinian territory. They were just taken. And uh, the, there are 140 illegal Israeli colonies in the West Bank, including 12 in East Jerusalem. And East Jerusalem is where um, they started. And the Israelis, uh, the citizens, as you can see in the upper left hand, that huge uh, colony, the roads leading into it are uh, Jewish only or Israeli only 
roads. Palestinians cannot drive on those roads. And there are over 620,000 Israelis that live in these 140 um, illegal um, colonies there. Next, please. The other piece is house demolitions. And I just uh, want to start with the upper right hand picture that we took. Um, the, as Amnesty International told us, Palestinians cannot get building permits. Even within Palestine or the West Bank itself. So, in a Palestinian family tradition, when a man goes out and gets married, he goes to his family. Now they have to build on top of their uh, parents' building. So, the first son gets his wife and they go in the second one, and the, the second son gets a wife and they're on the third level. That's how they do it in order for them to stay legal. And you could notice the water tank on top of the roof. And here's our church members in the um, lower right hand. Uh, this was the day after a seven story apartment building was demolished and our guide took us and we just couldn't believe what had happened. Um, and I think, I don't know what slide that is, but the, the house demolitions uh, in um, since 1920, Israel has raised 53 Palestinian structures within the West Bank, which affected more than 265,000 men, women, and children. And of course, the mil the military just protects the uh, those people that are demolishing homes. Next, please. This is another beautiful poster that shows what they have done with the closures and the checkpoints and the confiscations uh, and the forcible transfers. You can see all of those things. And what's made real are some of the pictures that I'm gonna show you next in the next slide. When we, when we were driving through, uh, this is um, just outside of Bethlehem, and our tour guide, when we get to one of these checkpoints, you'll see these uh, police um, jeeps. And he told us, his name was George Hudi. He said, don't look at these soldiers in their eyes. Uh, just look down and they ask you something. I'll translate if they speak in, in Hebrew, but just don't look at them in the eye. Um, I, I was a little late in understanding what he was saying. And this young man that's coming out, I took his picture. He was coming out of the back of the truck and our eyes met and he held up his uh, machine gun and just locked his blue eyes with my brown eyes and he walked right around to me and George just grabbed my hand, look down, just give him what he wants. And I didn't, I mean, I, I was a, an educator for many years and this young man looked like he was almost 13, 14 years old, but he had a gun and he had searing blue eyes and I wanted to have a principally principal type discussion with him, but he had the gun, so I kept my mouth shut. Thank God. And then um, these young Palestinian men are always chased. If they got, if they have five or six people having a cigarette or having something to eat together, uh, they would be chased. Uh, and this picture was taken. Um, very secretly and uh, 
my wife didn't like what I was doing, but I got these two pictures on our trips. Next, please. Now, this, um, this is a picture that I maybe many of you have seen how um, Palestine was shrinking, how Israel was expanding. But I want to emphasize the, the map on the right. You see the orange. The orange are Palestinians living in the West Bank that are all isolated. Uh, Janine isn't up there, but Janine is even further north. You can see Nablus, uh, you can see Ramallah, you can see Hebron, and the one on the right is Jericho, uh, and they're isolated from each other. The roads leading from one uh, village or town uh, is very difficult to get to, and you see how small uh, they're becoming. And the blue area on the right used to be Palestinian farmland, which is now totally controlled by the Israeli government, by Israeli farmers. It's, um, it's devastating to the economy of Palestinians and to the livelihood of Palestinians. Next, please. I, um, I guess, is that for you, Allison? Or I think we can just go through the fragmentation um, that we have been showing the, you can take a look at all of that. Let's, um, JJ, let's go ahead and name, this is almost more of a summary, but it really lifts up the, the unique features of Israeli apartheid, all of which we've covered, but maybe do you just wanna um, go through them briefly or do you want me to? Yeah, why don't you do that and, I'll give them the pictures as you finish. Um, so, um, so fragmentation is a unique feature of Israeli apartheid separating Palestinians in Israel, East Jerusalem, West Bank, Gaza, and um, refugee camps that aren't able to get into any of them. The permit system um, is uh, unique in that uh, your ID card controls what education you get, what medical care you get, where you can shop or run a business. It limits personal freedom, economic development, um, and it restricts the natural growth of villages uh, or cities. And uh, it's an arbitrary system of permits and licenses. Uh, limits to housing and development was uh, lifted up uh, frequently in the film with uh, its restrictive zoning scheme um, in which uh, Arab areas of Israel, East Jerusalem, and especially Area C of the West Bank um, uh, are limited for the expanding of Jewish settlements. Um, and Israel practices collective punishment, which is uh, routine punishment of entire Palestinian cities, neighborhoods, and families, Gaza is maybe the best example where 2 million inhabitants uh, are punished for the acts of a few, um, demolishing an alleged perpetrator's entire family home or revoking permits and privileges uh, from a whole group of people uh, or a whole community. And, and so, yeah, I, I wanted to get into uh, some other pictures, uh, about, especially about Gaza. I don't know when you have them. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one of the things ab about uh, collective punishment uh, that Israel does so well, uh, this is the Gaza Strip. And in the uh, top area is where Gaza City is. That's where my father's family uh, lived, um, uh, and S Palestinian, I mean, Tarazis are still in Gaza. A lot of the Tarazis don't want to leave uh, Gaza because they want to protect uh, St. Porfarius Church, where a lot of the Tarazis uh, attend uh, the church. Uh, but now take a look at this. Around Gaza, you have a red line, and that's a no-go zone. There are um, military towers all around Gaza, 
and soldiers are there. And if any Palestinian whose land, they, those um, areas used to be their farms, they can't even farm that anymore. And I got to tell you, the best strawberries in the world come from Gaza. Uh, if anybody has ever been there, they're just absolutely, they're almost the size of small apples. Uh, they're, they're not allowed to grow them anymore in that red area. If they get close, they get shot. And then it, the orange area is, you come close to us, <laughs> you're going to be hurt. And there's a game that soldiers play. They try to shoot out Palestinians' knees, and there are hundreds of Palestinians that have lost their knees, and they play soccer with their uh, canes. Uh, and it's it's um, you can look at uh, on uh, Google and see what uh, Gazans do for that. Um, and then the the three mile fishing zone. Most of Palestinians are fishermen. International law says that you can have up to 15 miles of uh, fishing. Where you stand to the horizon is about 15, 13 miles. And, but Israel has said Gazans can only go out three miles. And the Israeli Navy just keeps uh, monitoring that area. And recently, they found um, gas, natural gas in out there, and they want to keep Gazans away from there. And they just signed a treaty with Lebanon uh, to uh, sort of drill in that area. Uh, it's um, It just goes to some of the things that we're talking about. Two, almost two and a half million people live in a place where they can't get out of. They have uh, attacked Gaza uh, many times, destroyed their water treatment plants and, and a lot of other infrastructure. Uh, our church helped to bring a Gazan uh, to the United States and her young daughters, the first time they saw a plane, they ran to their mother. And, is, is that Israeli? And it, they heard drones on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis in Gaza. I can share a lot of more stories, but I, I want to get into some discussion. Let's get going, Allison. All right. Um... You've heard Amnesty International's report. You've heard Palestinian facts on the ground. You've heard what constitutes apartheid. Let's let's open it up. And I, I think I want to prioritize questions first. Um, and if you have a comment, please hold back a few minutes because I want to make sure if there are questions, especially clarifying questions, we have time to address those. And then, um, and then we can engage a little bit more into uh, comments and um, uh, Kathy, if you could uh, spotlight GJ at this point too, we need his um, voice. Um, but if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat or um, uh, raise your hand. Oh, you can raise your hand. We're here on the other side about Gazans attacking Israel. How is that? Is that just in response to Israeli oppression or how do we balance that out? Um, when, when you say uh, Palestinians attacking Israelis, I picture a young boy with a stone confronting a, an American built tank. Um, and then there are some fireworks that Gazans uh, do, uh, but there's such an, a um, disconnect between uh, Palestinians attacking Israelis and Israelis 
maintaining an apartheid state um, of Palestinians. Um, but I don't think this information that you're seeing and what Amnesty International has concluded ever gets into our media. And that's a shame as well. I don't know if that's an answer, but I think everyone has to make an individual decision about the uh, what some people call Palestinians attacking Israelis. We admire the- um, Actually, hold, hold on just a minute, okay? Because um, Flora, I, um, Carol had her hand up. I want to respond and then I'll call on you, okay? So don't, don't, don't forget your- um, don't forget your question. Um, I, I also want to respond that the effort to name apartheid is a nonviolent way of resisting what's happening and calling attention to it. So, um, so without affirming any form of violence, um, which which my faith doesn't allow me to do. Um, almost mandates that I engage in nonviolent forms of resistance, um, such as uh, educating myself and then engaging in action. Carol, you had your hand up and then Flora. Sure, um, he, in the amnesty video, he mentioned that the people who had stayed in Israel, the Palestinians uh, still had certain restrictions that the Jewish members of Israel don't have citizens of, and he mentioned something about even if they're in the legislature, and he didn't say more about that. And I just wondered if you or GJ know what restrictions there are on Palestinians who live in Israel who are in the legislature. Yeah, um, they have a list of laws they can vote for. They can't vote for all the laws that are uh, on, you know, up for a vote. And um, they, they are not on committees. We can go on and on and, and saying all those things. They are treated as second class citizens, even if they are elected officials. Let me leave it at that. And there are a lot of details that can go in that. And I, um, I, I don't have time to look it up now, but I do know Visualizing Palestine has a fabulous visual of the different amount of rights that different Palestinians have in each category. And uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel get the status second-class citizen, while the others don't even get any level of citizenship status. Flora, go ahead. Well, um, I th it it's, seems to me that we um, we the news has um, emphasized the crimes of the different Palestinian um, groups, and um, and we um, think of we have uh, co considered Isra Israel Israel um, protecting itself, and yet we admire. For instance, in we um, admire the citizens of Ukraine for um, protecting themselves and trying to save their land and their their country and their belongings. So it we really um, this is just so distressing to me, um, especially when I. Um, when I think that some some of these people who are being persecuted in this way are descendants of the early J Jerusalem church, and um, that um, is so sad, and it's and and I and another thing is I can't understand how. If we have the Geneva Convention and we have these, you know, why is nothing being done to protect these people? And often when the United Nations considers what's happening and what needs to be done, um, 
the United States uh, works hard to block any action from taking place. Um, in so fact, we have countries used, used our uh, uh, privilege of veto to ve veto the resolution. Uh, some progress, I think um, Biden just didn't vote this last time. So we, you know, we're a, accountable for not demanding that our government and and what's the worst thing is that we are continuing to give three billion dollars a year to israel for defense israel's defense 3.8 exactly uh thank you flora and um fahed i want to give you a chance to speak okay uh since uh, uh gj focused on the west bank and gaza and I'm born in the Galilee area, I'd like to take maybe two, three minutes and share my experience. So when Israel was established, they destroyed 500 villages and towns and exiled between 800 to a million people to the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Gaza, and, uh, and Egypt. So, my folks were 155,000 that stayed what became the state of Israel. So immediately Israel created 80 laws to control our lives. So answering your original question, Alison, really the apartheid system began day one because as a teenager, I couldn't leave my village to go to Akka or Haifa or Nazareth without going to the Israeli military governor and get a permit. If I'm found without a permit, I go to court and I go to jail. So the focus from day one, how do you control the 155,000 uh, with the, from education uh, to labor, to movement and so forth. So the, the thing that flashes in my mind, this happened between 48 and 66. That's when I came to the US. And uh, when my roommate said, I want to take you uh, to Detroit for Thanksgiving, I was in Florida. And I said to him, we need a permit. He said, what do you mean? I said, you know, I cannot go 10 miles without a permit. So when I reflect about my first Thanksgiving, it was the most liberating experience of my life. He said, this is Georgia, this is Tennessee. And we are, I mean, really, so let me jump uh, to GJ. From 1967 to the present, We're not talking about the permit from the West Bank to go to Israel. We're talking about a Palestinian from Bethlehem going to Jerusalem. You need a permit. Some people living in Bethlehem, six miles, never been in Jerusalem. So it's difficult for, for good old American folks to understand oppression. It's incredible. Okay, can I just respond? Thank you, Brother Fahad. Um, I think what Doris was saying earlier just says we have the Christian church that has to take that place of advocating for justice in Palestine. The, the church has the opportunity to stand up and uh, reflect what we're learning. Uh, the government hasn't been doing it at all, and everything seems to be against what uh, what we're trying to do in bringing about justice and calling what Israel is doing an apartheid state, the church has to step in. And if I can add to that as we're wrapping up is that when it came to um, challenging South African apartheid, the church played a pivotal role in naming apartheid, which demanded uh, the political world to uh, the, the the political uh, players to 
to deal with that accusation. Um, and in um, the Jim Crow South, uh, it was the churches, primarily the black churches that were pivotal in ending the legalized uh, apartheid in the Jim Crow South. So, so the churches do have a powerful role to play. Um, at this point, I want to. Um, uh, we want to be. We want to be done by um, five fifteen, my time, eight fifteen, your time. I want to honor that, but I, I do want to return us to um, this document that was written by Kairos Palestine and, and Global Kairos as we come to an end um, of our conversation tonight. And this is uh, the conclusion of the um, of the first section uh, of their document. A thorough examination of the actual facts on the ground clearly establishes the basis for the charge of the crime of apartheid. And I, and I hope that uh, uh, you, you feel the, the impact of, um, uh, of the three conditions being met. Some will charge that labeling Israel an apartheid regime is an expression of anti-Semitism or an attempt to delegitimize the state of Israel but to date, those who would distract the world's attention by making such charges have yet to publish a reasoned argument refuting these facts. To call Israel an apartheid regime is not a political epithet, and indeed our main problem is apartheid and the apartheid regime. That's what we're challenging here. Um, nor does it require comparisons to South Africa but an examination of the actual facts on the ground, which fulfills the legal elements established by the crime of apartheid. These elements are so clearly there, there is no surprise that Israel is worried about the International Criminal Court or that it seeks to label as terrorist organizations, those organizations that are carefully documenting its behavior on the ground in preparation for the day when the ICC will hear this case. And Can the, we get a copy of that? Absolutely. In the um, chat, there is a link to this entire document. Um, it's maybe a 50, 60 page document, and it's the, the document that really is the crux of this study. We've only tapped into section one of it tonight, and next month we'll be looking at uh, biblical and theological implications. Um, what is the church called to do? Uh, and, then, and then the third session. Um, will be what, what are faithful responses? What does it mean to incarnate the gospel of liberation? Uh, uh, and um, GJ, do you have any last words? <laughs> You're asking a Palestinian for last words. <laughs> uh, I, I think that this discussion um, slowly developing what uh, uh, Allison has started is so significant for the Alliance of Baptists to make a stand. And the Alliance has always been one step ahead of some other Christian faiths. And I'm so proud to be part of this process. So let's come up with as hard a questions as we can for next month's meeting. And let's continue to delve into the role of the Alliance of Baptist in this effort. I have a, a question for you, if you don't mind, to elaborate a little bit more on the Christian presence in Gaza. I was lucky to be there with Middle East Council of Churches years ago when we were allowed in. Um, and, and yet you don't have that feeling at all. And speaking about our Christian heritage and the land is a way to approach our Christian churches. And we have a clear call from Palestinian Christians to say, be the church. Yeah, exactly. And, and Mary Lou, you're so right. Um, the Christian population, not only in Gaza, but in all of the West Bank, is diminishing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it breaks my heart uh, to see so many uh, Christians leaving the place where um, Jesus walked. Mm -hmm. And that means 
a hundred years ago, we were 25% of the Palestinian population and all statistics say we are less than 2%. So to me, this is a red line for the church if we think about the global church. As we come to a closing, many of us just honored, celebrated, recognized Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Um, and in so doing, we honored him as one of the great modern prophets who calls out to the church and to all people of conscience to join together and to demand justice for all who are repressed. His work, he reminds us of the indivisibility of justice, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, and, and he said this when he was giving his speech at Riverside Church condemning US involvement in Vietnam, recognizing in that speech and getting into significant trouble, um, recognizing the impact of the um, international relationships um, causing great harm to the world. Um, he, he was very aware that US has a power in the world that must be checked. It makes me wonder what he would say about the fact that Israel, who's perpetrating the crime of apartheid, receives more US funding than any other country in the world. As Flora mentioned, uh, 3.8 billion, which amounts to $10 million a day. As an aside, it seems to me that uh, Congress could solve a whole lot of debt ceiling concerns if they simply shrank that, but uh, that's not what we're here to discuss tonight. In light of the prophetic challenges of Dr. King, in light of the horrors the devastation, the tragedy that is taking place on the ground in light of God's vision for well-being for all people, Palestinians and Israelis and Jews and Muslims and Christians and people of conscience, may we sit with what we've learned tonight. May we pray on how we might be moved by it. And may we continue the work of liberation for all of God's children in our country and abroad. I wanna thank you for coming tonight, being part of this important discussion. We will send out a link with a recording of it with a link to uh, the dossier uh, and the uh, um, and we will um, all hope to see you again in one month for part two. Thank you. Thank you very much.